And welcome everyone to Sports Talk Line, where we talk sports 24-7, 365. And on today's episode of Battle for the Big East, we're going to go into recruiting with ESPN college basketball recruiting guru, Paul Biancardi. Paul, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Tom. Thanks for having me. Yes, thanks for coming on, Paul, in this you know lovely time of May where you know I guess the college hoops fans are going through a little bit of withdrawal, to say the least. Um, but I'm going to ask you, you know, getting right into it too, you know, we focus on the Big East here. What are some of the elite recruiting classes we have coming into the Big East? Which ones do have the fan base that should be excited for, for all the incoming talent coming in as freshmen for next season? Yeah, the Big East did well in recruiting. Uh, UConn did exceptionally well. They're number 10 class in the country, according to ESPN. Georgetown, top 25 class. Uh, Creighton has an excellent class. And even though Villanova does not have a ranked class uh, per se, they have some really good players coming in. So I think the Big East did really well this year in recruiting. Yeah, I think if you're Villanova, whoever they get, they're going to get the benefit of the doubt, you know, because they're coming in. No one stay there two or three years. You become a first round pick and have a 10 year NBA career. Nothing wrong with that. Um, Yeah, look at Jalen Brunson, right? You know, Jalen Brunson, I think, uh, Ryan Archie, Archie Diacono, Mikhail Bridges, so many guys from Villanova who are doing, having solid NBA careers, which is something, you know, a lot of times it doesn't translate, uh, at least in the last few years, is one thing. So, you know, we kind of talked about the specific teams. You know, you mentioned Georgetown. I believe Ryan Matumbo, the Kembe Matumbo's son is coming in. He's one of the top recruits. But there are more highly rated recruits outside of Matumbo coming into the Big East. Who are some of those recruits coming in for the Big East next season? Well, if you stay with Georgetown, Aminu Muhammad, that's a guy to get excited about going to Georgetown. This guy's high energy. He's really put together. He's physically imposing. He's aggressive. He scores the ball by the drive and the jump shot. I think he's an impact player for Patrick Ewing, and I think he's a guy that the Big East will be very excited about because he just – he comes at you all game long, and he only knows one way to play. He gets player comparisons to a uh, Victor Oladipo uh, a lot, but you know that those are high and lofty standards. But I think it's that type of energy, the effort, and the alpha dog mentality of why people are excited about Muhammad. Uh, when you look at Connecticut, uh, Rasul Diggins is a guy who can really score the ball, bouncy with a quick first step. He's a combo guard. He has the ability to really score points at a high clip for a freshman. Uh, Connecticut has an excellent class, as I mentioned. They also have Samson Johnson. He's long and athletic. Boy, I'll tell you what, you want upside in the class? Johnson is upside. He's got all the physical measurables. He's fluid. He's long. He's got agility. He moves well in tight spaces. He's got good hands. He's got a soft touch. He's still putting it all together. His best years are ahead of him uh, going to Connecticut. Now, you know, you ran through three players right there. Now, do you see any of the players you just mentioned uh, or anyone else who's going to be a freshman coming into the Big East as a one-and-done player? Are there any one-and-done caliber players, or do you see these players are going to stick around in the program for a few years and develop? Yeah, I think they need to stick around, and hopefully they will stick around. Now, one-and-done can mean a lot of things. I mean, they can leave, and that Mm -hmm. makes them a one-and-done. doesn't mean they're going to – you know, get drafted in the first or second round of the NBA. A lot has to do with their development, what they do right now in the offseason, the May, the June, July, August, time they spend with the strength and conditioning coach, time they get a chance to work out with their with their coaches. You know, what they do on the unseen hours, really important. Now, some guys can really uh, propel themselves into one and dones after one year. And, but by and large, all these recruits going into the Big East are multiple-year players, and you know some have the chance to make it to the NBA draft uh, with major development. But you need major development. You just can't have upside, though I think uh, Samson Johnson may have as much upside as anyone else coming into the Big East. Speaking about upside, make sure you click that like and subscribe button on YouTube so you can see all of our sports talk line videos, whether it's Battle for the Big East or NBA Highlights. So now we kind of talked about the freshmen coming into the Big East next year. Now, one of the, I guess, two massive developments were decisions made by the NCAA. The first one came out almost at the beginning of the season when they said, you know what, 
just like Oprah, everyone's going to get an extra year of eligibility. That was <laughs> one big, big thing, which was kind of like, okay, and, and, you know, how's this going to impact things? And the second was the alteration on the transfer rule where it says for the first time transfer, you do not need to sit out. Now, right. how do you see, let, let's first talk about what, what I think is the most um, important one. I would say would be the fifth year of eligibility because this was something no one planned for. Cause I do believe a lot of college teams, they kind of have scholarships light up, even though someone hasn't declared, you kind of got a good idea of who's going to leave college after their junior year or something like that. But now you're in a situation where this was totally unexpected and you have some players taking advantage of it. And some players who are just like, that's it. I'm done. Just ask Georgetown. None of the, none of their key players are coming back uh, who could, who were seniors. How do you see the impact of this fifth year of eligibility, not only for this year, but years to come? How do you see that impacting recruiting? Well, first of all, to address this year. So anybody who played college basketball last year, they get their year back of eligibility. And for seniors, that means that they can come back to the team that they played on, or obviously they can go somewhere else and play. Um, so it's really uh, impactful to rosters because coaches don't know who they're going to have next year. You know, seniors don't know. Usually seniors are up and gone. Either they're in the working world or they're trying to make a basketball living somewhere else. So it, it's taken the seniors some time to figure out, hey, am I coming back to college basketball? Am I coming back to the team that I just played for? Uh, and that leaves a, a head coach and his roster in flux. So all the other players, the freshmen, sophomores, and juniors, they continue to be freshmen and sophomores and juniors this year in terms of eligibility. And, and I think it really puts a, uh, a gridlock on, on roster management for coaches. Coaches once would look at their roster and say, well, okay, he's a senior. You know, we, we need this because we're losing this from the senior class. We're losing this in the junior class. So we're going to replace it. Uh, none of this has ever been a thought of before, you know, players having a, another year of eligibility. And then you add into that the ability for transfers now to transfer and play right away. It, it's created some chaos, to be quite honest, in college basketball. Who's coming back? Who's coming in? And who's leaving? So coaches are really juggling their roster right now, trying to figure out what their needs are based on who's leaving and who's coming back. It, it's been really tough to manage uh, this offseason. Now, who do you think it has been toughest on? Do you think it's been toughest on the coaches or I think who it could be toughest on would be the incoming freshmen because they were coming in being like, okay, all right, uh, Colin, Gillespie, you know, I, I just, I'll just go with Colin Gillespie because I really yeah. think his knee injury might've been a driving force in him coming back. Sure. So trying to get healthy in his, his draft status. Um, but I definitely think, you know, if you're, a high school senior now, or you're finishing your post-grad year, what advice would you give to that high school senior or post-grad student who was thinking about playing college basketball? Well, what I would say is this, is because of what we just mentioned, everyone getting a year of eligibility back and the portal where guys can transfer and play right away. The high school player got shortchanged this year in many ways. College coaches couldn't watch them play because nobody's been out live since COVID. Uh, coaches are still not out. As we approach June 1st, they're going to be allowed out to finally see high school players. So they did not get recruited at the pace and the intensity that they have in the past as seniors. So a lot of them will not go to the level maybe that they could have went to. So I say for class of 2021, find a home. It's not about your destination, like what level and what program you may want to play for. It's going to come down to opportunity. Take the opportunity that you have. Take the opportunity that most wants you and make that work. And in due time, if things work out really well, and then maybe you can go to a school that you had hopes of or dreams of, you know, before the COVID situation. Or maybe it'll just stay where you are and really enjoy it. You know, it's okay not to transfer. You know, sometimes I think guys do it just because everybody else is doing it. But the, but the high school kid really got hurt, and I think it's going to be a backup effect. The class of 2022, they're not getting looked at unless you're elite. And when I say elite, and if you're in the top, you know, the ESPN 100, which is the senior class, the ESPN 60, which is the junior class, you're not getting recruited right now. 
because college coaches want to, the phrase goes, get old and stay old. And the way you do that is by taking a proven commodity at a different program that you're comfortable with and you plug him into your roster knowing that if he transfers, he has to sit out. See, the high school kid, the college coach feels this way about the high school player. Hey, we're going to go through all this work to get him. We're going to develop him. We're going to pour into him. And then in two years, he may leave us. And that's true. That That's the risk of taking a high school player now versus a transfer. So college coaches are looking more, you know, to get an older player and somebody who may not transfer. You know, you definitely bring up a good point where it's almost if you bring a kid from straight out of high school, they can leave without sitting out. But if you bring in a transfer, they do have that. So, so do you see, let me ask you this question. Do you see down the line or, you know, I believe Iowa state had this uh, several years ago, I believe with Fred Hoiberg, if I'm not mistaken, I believe he's at uh, Nebraska right now, but do you see a lot of college coaches being like, no, what? I'm just going to work the transfer portal from March to May see who's available instead of putting in all this countless hours at the gym for someone who, you know what, I, I'm just a stepping stone for. Did you see that shift in college coaches where they're just going to focus more on the transfer portal than they are in high school? Or do you still see some players still being like, no, what we'll still grab some high school kids and try to get a blend with the transfer portal and uh, high school development. Well, because it's brand new, I think a lot of coaches are excited about transfers. You know, they're not real excited when guys leave their program, mm -hmm. but they're real excited about the opportunity to get guys in their program. So most coaches that I speak with at all levels are looking for immediate gratification, immediate help on the basketball court. And that's where you look to the transfer. Uh, but some are still looking at high school players. If you think about it in some ways, Tom, I, I would spend time with the high school players now because – most college coaches are spending time looking at transfers. So maybe you can go somewhere where other people are not. Uh, you can't be afraid to take the high school player or you can't be afraid that they're going to leave. Uh, mm -hmm. I just think you want to have a healthy blend and a healthy balance on your roster. If you have all transfers plus upperclassmen, yes, you're going to be old. You may be good, but that also means you're going to have to replace that squad next year. And you become like a prep school or maybe even a junior college. Yeah, you know, you definitely bring up a good point. And I'll just point this one thing out. I believe Villanova, they had one transfer. You know, and I think a lot of these top schools, you know, as you mentioned, getting old, it's also, I guess, uh, you want continue continuation. You want the same players coming back where you don't have this upheaval. And I think the elite programs, what, what I think, you're going to see a lot of players transfer from Duke and Kentucky, even Kansas, maybe Michigan State. Be like, no, what? I'm going to go somewhere else. They're either going to transfer because very rarely do you see players stay for a second year at those universities. And you kind of seen the downtick where all of a sudden they're relatively young. But if you don't have Zion Williamson and RJ Barrett coming in, it, it's very difficult to make runs in the NCAA tournament. So I definitely think the impact of this, of both of these, both the fifth year of eligibility and also the transfer portal. Now, now I guess our final question I'll ask is what is your opinion on this new transfer rule? Are you for it or against it? Or is it a shade of gray for you? No, I'm for it. I'm, I totally am for kids transferring. Uh, and I'm, I'm okay with kids playing right away. I'm of the opinion, though, that when they would sit out, as they did in the past in all my years of coaching at Boston College, Ohio State, St. Louis, and Wright State, uh, I found that year of sitting out to be a year of growth, development, improvement, it took the pressure off the player to impact the program right away. You can learn the system. Uh, you can learn the terminology, get comfortable academically, and spend a lot of time with the strength and conditioning coach to change his body. So I didn't look at it as a penalty. I looked at it as a plus. Uh, but kids want to play right away, and there were too many waiver situations going on, and I think the NCAA was tired of being uh, – either suit or potentially suit. So, so they granted a, a play right away, which I'm, I'm totally good about. I am so happy they put a deadline to it, though. Uh, this year it's July 1st, which is yeah. kind of late. Uh, next year it's going to be May 1st. Okay. I, think you can even, I think you can even go to April 15th uh, because kids know when they want to transfer. They usually know by the end of the season. If, and, uh, and I think this, yeah, I think it's important to note, and it's not so much for the coaches, okay? Nobody feels bad for coaches, nor should they. But 
if we're all in a locker room together and I'm counting on you, you're going to be the point guard next year and I'm, I'm going to be one of the starters with you. And then all of a sudden you decide to leave in May or you know June. Now that that hurts our team. Now you have the right to transfer. You don't owe any of your teammates anything to stay, but it would be nice to know early in the process if you're going to leave. So then maybe I'll leave or maybe I'll stay uh, based on you know who else comes in. I, I just think you've got other guys in the locker room that you probably need to let them know what you're thinking as a good teammate. Yeah, I, I think I agree with that, but it could also be the opposite way where a coach leaves and he brings some of his key players with them. I'm kind of waiting to see that. Yeah, that's going to happen too. Oh yeah, that, that that's going to floodgate, no question. Yeah, but Paul, thanks for coming on. This was our season finale. I want to appreciate hey. say thank you to everyone who came on from I think uh, October, November, all this during this crazy time. I appreciate all our guests. Thanks to you, Paul. And hopefully we see everyone once again. We, we might drop some summer episodes. We'll see what happens, but we'll be looking forward once basketball starts coming up, when the leaves start changing in October, November. And hopefully we'll actually have fans in the arenas. We'll see. But to everyone for who came on this year for our first season of Battle for the Big East, thank you. And I want to send to you, Paul, for coming in on this day. And remember to listen like you play with intensity.